you so much for all of you to be here. And uh, I want to really thank to all the organizers of this beautiful event. Uh, they approached me, and um, I couldn't possibly say no, because it is so interesting to do these things. So why natural dyes? Natural dyes, well, first of all, because it's the right thing to do in some way, right? This is what they used to do. It is very interesting because you have to play with it a lot, and the dyes are, um, they have their own characters, they might like certain things and not like other things, and to figure that out is very interesting. But also, they are very humbling, because you cannot force them quite as much as you can force the chemical dyes. So sometimes you want this color and they will give you something very different or they will give you nothing or sometimes you don't expect anything and they will give you amazing stuff, right? So it is really a nice journey. It is really interesting. It is really fascinating. So today, uh, today we'll talk just very briefly about history, which is not very good for us. Um, we'll talk a little bit about fabric dyeing versus egg dyeing, because this is where we get most of our information, inspiration, and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about the kinds of natural dyes that you can get and where you can get them, mordants, and uh, some resources. All right, so now as the catch, attention catcher, we have here the uh, 3,000 or maybe 2,500 not quite sure, your old uh, Punic ostrich egg. And these, this is the, my favorite of the old, old eggs. Um, from uh, Spain, Punic means originally from uh, Carthage. They had colonies. And so these guys, because they were originally from Carthage, so North Africa, they used a lot of ostrich eggs. Um, now there's some digging going on in different parts of Africa, and they're finding really, really, really old ones, like Bronze Age, um, close to Stone Age, and things like that. So that means that it almost puts the egg art close to uh, the earliest art that we have. So this is probably, I don't know, ochre or something like that. And this museum, actually, in Ibiza, has a whole collection of ostrich eggs, and they're beautiful, but the museum's website is not very functional, if at all. So. Go there. I'll go there when I have a chance. All right, so a little bit of history. Um, now, for about 100 years now, since we got the chemical dyes, um, we stopped using natural dyes because chemical dyes are so much easier to use. They're so much more predictable and things like that. So generally speaking, the tradition of using dyes and achieving different colors with natural dyes has been lost. And it's been only about 20 years. I think Miroslava can probably correct me. But from what I understand, about 20 years, then actually people started trying to use natural dyes on eggs again. Now, 20 years is very short time for, uh, for a tradition, right? So um, that means any one of you, if you sort of pledge into it and start doing it, you can actually discover some things. So I've been playing with this for two, three years. Uh, I think I dyed an egg with a dye that I've never heard anybody else dying with, and that's become my favorite dye, for example, right? So there's a lot of um, a lot of possibility. And then this one probably most of you have seen. This is probably the oldest so far found Ukrainian egg on the actual eggshell, uh, likely goose, I think, or something like that. Uh, 15th, 16th century found in Lviv, probably, what, three years ago or something like this. OK, so now, because the tradition was mainly lost, you could get some records like, OK, you can use this bark uh, to achieve this dye, right? Or you can use this flower to achieve that dye. And this is pretty much the extent of what was still in the sources, right? So some of the old catalogs had some sources. My grandmother knew that you can use this dye for that, but she never actually used them. She just knew about it. She heard about it. So uh, the Pesanka artists, mainly in Ukraine, when they decided, OK, we, we want to start using natural dyes, what they did, they did what everybody else would do. They went to the guys who were dyeing textiles. Because a lot of the dyes that are used on textiles can also be used on, fab on uh, eggs. 
and with somewhat similar, somewhat different results. So this is what they did, and they start playing with it. So I think the, the first person who has something in the book was Taras Horodetsky, so that's the book you can probably get, it's Kuta Uma. And there is a little bit of description at the back of sort of vague recipes and what he's tried using. And now these two people, Tatiana Lenenko and Lyubov Titorova, they have used a lot. And I think in Ukraine, they're probably considered the gurus of uh, natural dyeing. Um, they have three basic recipes, uh, I think one for dried things, one for berries, and one for something else all in Ukrainian, of course, and the recipes are quite vague. I mean, they're gene it's a generic recipe. It's something you should try and see what happens and then try and adjust. And then they have some information on some plants that they used and what dyes it gave as different mordants. So uh, these are the things. Now, if you, so these are the only things really that are there for dyes, except there is one uh, more small handbook just published in Ukraine maybe two months ago. Uh, that still has not arrived here. And that has proper recipes, and that has a lot of recipes of dyes that are used, uh, sort of fresh dyes, something that you would harvest yourself from the tree or from, from a flower and just make it. Um, in English, I've been just told yesterday by, by Francois that there has been a book published in US, but it is a rare treat, so we'll try to get our hands on it. But other than that, the only resources in English that you would have would be actually the resources of people who are using textiles, uh, who are dyeing textiles with natural dyes. I went to library and I got, what, like 10 books on natural dyeing in library in Toronto. So it's very easy. Um, went through, sort of flipped through them. Um, at least two that I found, I actually already ordered online. Now, these are still the library copies, so please don't steal them. Um, but they are really interesting, and so those of you who are interested, you can flip through them and see. So this first one has uh, a lot of historic accounts and historic recipes of sort of traditional dyes. This one has a lot of um, recipes and plant-by-plant -plant sort of uh, accounts of what you can do with plants found around here. Well, from here probably till middle of US, some of them all the way down to Arizona or something like that, right? So actual local plants. So that's really interesting um, to, to use. Now, another thing you can do, and many of you probably did this, you can find blogs, you can find videos, you can find photos, you can find recipes. You can find a lot of recipes for krashanke. I mean, of course, krashanke is a little bit of a different deal because uh, you can't really uh, boil a waxed egg because the wax will come off, right? But if you're doing scratched eggs, then your, uh, probably your possibility of, of dyeing things expands a lot. Or if you're just using one color thing and then we'll etch them or something like that. Now, the, another thing that you will find from those people who are using fabrics is a lot of these little secrets, uh, like what dye likes what kind of water, uh, including acidity, mineral composition, the temperatures, and things like that. So you will find, for example, that oh, mother doesn't like the temperature higher than something like 80 Celsius or something like this. So you can't really boil it. If you boil it, instead of giving you red, it will give you brown, for example. Now, this is something that you will find from these textile guys, right? Or um, let's say Brazil wood likes uh, hard water. So if your water is not particularly hard, you can uh, take some stublet and throw it, some calcium, throw it in the water and let it boil, things like that, right? All these little things that are not covered by those generic recipes, G generic recipes of just sort of, you know, one recipe for all plants. Now, differences, right? So one of the differences is that, well, first of all, we can't boil our waxed eggs. So most textile dyes are actually, most, most textiles are dyed at very high temperatures. This we cannot do, right? So some things that work for them are not gonna work for us. Other things that work for them are not gonna work for us because um, the procedure is different. 
So just for curiosity's sake, I tried indigo dye that was working perfectly on the fabric. It did absolutely nothing for the egg, for me. I mean, maybe you will be a person who will discover actually what to do with indigo because indigo is the source of blue for natural dyes, indigo or indigo's cousins, right? Now, something that is a factor for, uh, for evaluating a lot of natural dyes for fabrics is there's two things. There is light fastness and there is wash fastness. Now, light fastness is something that is important for us because it is um, basically a criterion that they, they use to see how long the dye will last if it is exposed to light. Right? So now, for example, blueberry dye on eggs, if you just use it for blue color, will fade very fast. This is what I've heard. I haven't tried for, for that particular reason, right? It's very, dyes beautifully and fast, but it will fade away if you expose it to sun. So unless you want to keep your eggs locked in a you know, cupboard or something like that, or hide them and only pull them out, you can't really use that dye, or you can use it, but for short-term results. Uh, so that is something that you also learn from fabric guys, right? Having said that, the this light fastness might not be the same for eggs and for fabrics, right? So that's, and also generally, I mean, we don't wear our eggs on a sunny day out, right? So they're not exposed, exposed quite, quite as much as, as the, you know, the fabrics are, right? So that's something to take into account. So this is one of the difference. Sometimes it is to our advantage. Now, the wash fastness is something that is very important for fab fabrics, but it's totally not important for us because we don't put our eggs into laundry Right? So if it washes away, we don't really care at all, actually. Right? So these are some things to, to just know and to notice. Uh, color restriction methods, again, some things might not work. So I'm not sure whether this indigo thing, so the watt dyes, whether all watt dyes like indigo will not work for eggs, I haven't tried. Some mushroom uh, dyes are used sort of in a similar fermentation method. I don't know whether they would work for eggs, but so these are the things to explore and try, try out. I don't think anybody has tried mushrooms, mushroom dyes on eggs yet so much. Okay, now kinds of dyes. So something that you will get in stores that st sell the dyes for fabrics is what they call dye extracts. So this is something you will get um, in the form of a powder, or sometimes it sort of solidifies a little bit, but basically they extract it from the actual plant or animal material. I'm not sure what process they use for that. Now they are more effective in a way, they're more concentrated. Sometimes uh, you just need to actually take that powder and pour boiling water over it, mix it with a spoon, add the mordant and it works. So that's how that one of the gold yellow dyes that you have there, this natural dye sort of corner, this is how it's made. It's very simple, you don't have to boil it, you don't have to actually work with it a lot. Uh, and you can buy them from different suppliers that supply fabric dyes. Now, on the other hand though, if I'm using a flower to dye uh, an egg, I actually want to see the flower, I don't want to see the powder because that defeats sort of part of the purpose of, of it being a real thing, right? So there are sort of pluses, minuses, things like that. But they, they are a good source of something that you could use if you have nothing. You can go, order it online, uh, it will come, and you can use them and try in the middle of the winter where you, you, know, you have nothing in your freezer or fridge or uh, whatever, right? So here on the top, you can see there is on the sort of top left, my mouse doesn't work here, top left uh, corner, you, you can see that pouch, that's a coreopsis extract. On the top right, sort of the purple one, that's logwood extract, so they're from two different suppliers, so they're differently packaged. And so the yellow in that egg comes from coreopsis, the dark background comes from logwood, and then the red comes from the wood chips that you can see there in the middle of sapon wood, right? And then another example in bottom corner, buckthorn, a uh, common source for yellow dye, works really nicely for eggs. It does spoil sort of fast, but uh, that's what happens sometimes. Um, all right, so now dried material. So this is if you have time, resources, you want to play a little bit more, and you want to actually do the real thing, uh, the next easy thing you can get your hands on is the dried material. So sometimes it's wood chips, so on top you can see sapon wood there. Sometimes it is flowers, right? So this is 
uh, malva flower, and that's the color that gave me sort of olive green from the herb store here in Toronto called Herbie's Herbs. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, but it is the best uh, Toronto store for herbs, for medicinal herbs. And so in that store, you can find a lot of them. You can also order them online. Um, so again, you can buy some of these also from the dye stores, but you can also buy these from medicinal herb stores. So that's another full source of things that you can use if you don't have a dye store uh, available to you. Um, and I like these guys, but they're a little bit more finicky in many ways, but at the same time, they are as close to real deal. And also you can harvest things, dry them yourselves, right? And then those that deliver dye in their, dye, in their dried form, you can use them. Now some things, when you dry them, they will not give you the same dye as when they're fresh. So 100 years ago, they didn't have freezers. Now we do. So a lot of the things that you can actually collect when it's fresh, you can put in a freezer and you can make a diet of it and some of them work really well or just as well as the fresh ones. I've known people who've tried it and the mulberry dye that we have there is uh, a little moody, but this is from the mulberries from the tree here in Toronto from last summer, right? That's been frozen, sitting in the freezer and there is plenty of mulberries around there like dirt. Right? I mean, people don't like them because they stain the sidewalks and, and things like that. So these are the things you can also do that they couldn't do 100 years ago because freezers were not there. Now, I haven't tried dried mulberry, but I've tried dried um, elderberry. And while fresh elderberry is supposed to give really nice blue, purplish, down to dark, dark, almost black, the only thing I got from dried elderberry was sort of brown, a little bit boring brown. I mean, it's still a dye, it still works, but it works differently, right? So, um, you know, you can do different things with those. Actually, this background, that was dried elderberry. A little bit not so good. Okay, so now, fresh things. Now, fresh things are the most tricky ones, but in some ways, the most rewarding ones. So um, fresh plants, a lot of yellow and green dyes come from fresh plants only. And this is the issue that the fabric dyers have because they cannot really get a good green dye unless they use uh, copper mordants, which are uh, poisonous and apparently very bad for environment. Or if they over dye something that's yellow with a blue dye. Right? Now for us, there is quite a lot of fresh stuff that can give moderately good results in green dye. I've heard things about spinach, I haven't tried it, but there are also other things like um, krupeva. Nettle, right. Nettle, fresh nettle gives nice sort of, uh, not even hockey green, but like, you know, pale, nice green. And if you leave it for a while, it gives a good green. Now, somebody just posted on Facebook yesterday, they took the petals of red tulips, uh, made the dye, and it gave beautiful green dye. And that always, often what will happen, that the dark red flowers will give quite a nice uh, green dye when they're, when they're cooked. So malva flower, for example, if you get malvas that are dark burgundy, it will give the green dye things like that. So uh, these things are available to us. They are not used so much for, fabric, for, for fabrics. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure technologically maybe it poses some problems or something, right? Um, berries is another example. So um, flowers, leaves, husks, uh, walnut husks, um, whole plants and mushrooms that I don't think anybody's tried yet, but you can be the first one to try mushrooms. Some mushrooms are actually just boiled, um, so they might uh, work to extract dyes. Uh, mushrooms and lichen also. Uh, so all this blue you have here, that's the purple cabbage. It's very simple to do. You can get in a grocery store, uh, make it very easily. So you can see some of these eggs down there. It's been, I think, a year and a half or so. Uh, they have, been, have not been kept very hidden from light, and they have not been also exposed too much. It sort of lasts a bit, but generally people who use, uh, who dye fabrics, they don't like cabbage because they say it doesn't last, right? So it might be slightly different for us. It stinks, but it only, the egg only stinks for about two or three weeks. 
Um, I mean, more, I mean, we are all Ukrainian. I mean, we're used to cabbage, right? So not all of us are Ukrainian, but even those who are not Ukrainian are used to cabbage, right? So it smells like cabbage. Um, it's not horrible. There are things that smell worse. Uh, walnut dye smells worse, actually, to me. All right. Now, mordants and other things. So something that has been used historically for natural dyes is mordants. We see them as chemicals. They're not necessarily chemicals in a bad way because most of them occur naturally. And in fact, one of the sources of uh, alum mordant in Europe in Middle Ages was uh, near to Ujhorod. So that's just west West Ukraine, and this is what the, if you go to like German page of alum, they will tell you we got this from Italy. This, 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 and this, you know, Western Ukraine, Eastern Hungary, or whatever it was at the time, right? So this is something that occurs at salt. You can buy it in a grocery store because it's used for pickling. And alum is the most. It's potassium aluminium sulfate. It's the most common and most safe thing that you can use. Uh, to actually enhance the natural dyes. And it doesn't only enhance the color, it often also affects this light fastness and wash fastness of the dye. So how long it's going to stay and how well it's going to adhere. And generally, alum just makes the dyes slightly brighter or more intense. Now, another thing that also can be used that is... Um, was used historically a lot also, and it is available is iron. So ferrous sulfate, this is the most common iron supplement. Um, that So whoever is eating iron supplement daily is eating probably that or a cousin of it or something like this. So it can't be too poisonous, uh, really. And uh, iron generally makes the dye much darker, but it doesn't always work or it doesn't well, not all, not all mordants work equally or at all with all dyes. So, and for eggs also, they do different things. So, for example, my favorite yellow coreopsis, if you add iron mordant, it's supposed to give brown dye, and it does work like that on different, um, um, different textiles, both on silk and wool and cotton. But for the egg, it did absolutely nothing. So that's sort of one of examples. And then we have there also one of the iron dyes we have there is the red dye, uh, generally red dye. When, you, when I added iron to it, it became black, and it dyes a decent black. So that was red sapon wood, cousin of Brazil wood, so one of the traditional ones. So they do things, right? But again, um, even if we take the notes of people who did textiles, we have to try them and see, and sometimes it will work, and sometimes it won't work, and sometimes something that doesn't work for them will work for us. So that is the beauty of this whole constant sort of trying out and discovery. There are other things. There is vinegar uh, or soda to change the pH, and then pH changes the color for some dyes. So generally, if you have blue dyes, they will go uh, sort of towards red, I think, when they are more acidic, and towards uh, blue uh, when they're uh, more basic. However, it's different for different dyes. I, in one of the books, I saw this chart, and for some, it worked totally opposite. So uh, go figure, right? It's a really interesting thing. Cream of tartar is another thing. Chalk is another thing. So all of these things are available. Now, there are some really nasty uh, mordants too, and a lot of them were used historically, and a lot of them are still used for, uh, for textiles. But I, and these guys, uh, these guys in Ukraine, they used a bunch of them, but I would not really suggest because they are really nasty. So it's chromium, copper, uh, and zinc, and something else they use sometimes, uh, tin, right? All of them are supposedly pretty bad. Okay, so we are getting close to, oh, I'm good on time, 26 minutes. Um, so some of the useful resources, so some of them already talked about. So this is, in Ukraine, and you have this book that has a little bit, you have this book, that's the second one that has a little bit. And then there is a, a person who does a lot of dyeing and a lot of documenting what she does. And this is a person who made this new handbook that just came out two months ago. 
and she has a blog. She's also on Facebook. So if you can read Ukrainian, um, and I mean, her eggs are absolutely beautiful, both the traditional ones and her own eggs. I, I mean, she's, this girl is total gold, right? So follow her or friend her on Facebook. And uh, if you can read Ukrainian, it's amazing source. This is the only reason I'm doing this is because I saw her blog a couple of years ago and totally, totally inspired me. Because a lot of people do this in Ukraine, but very few people actually document what they're doing. Or maybe they document, but quite a few of them are a little secretive about it. So uh, she is the one who's not secretive. And so that's quite rare. Now, in English, uh, again, there is that one book I just found out about uh, yesterday. Colleen Macaulay. Colleen Macaulay, right. Um, other than that, I sort of started my own blog, but I don't do it quite often enough. But if there is some interest, I will probably post things more frequently. It's just sort of, yeah? Didn't Luba Petrusha translate some of perhaps his book into English? Did that may have not been I think she did. I think she translated some of the, or, or, or all of that book. I think I've seen that too. Yeah. Luba so Petrusha, that would be, yeah. Detroit, that would be a, a, a good resource, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. I mean, I I know about her. I follow her on Facebook, but I haven't seen this thing. So that could be something. Having said that, I don't know whether she would have translated the part because in Taras's book, there's only like last three pages that has some of the recipes of the things. But uh, these, you know, two next links that you also have on your website are those two online stores: one in Vancouver, one in Halifax. The one in Vancouver or Vancouver Island. I'm not quite sure, um, that maiva.com, it has a very useful free PDF booklet you can download from them. And there is a little bit more information also on the site, but this was the first thing they actually tried, and that was extremely useful because it had recipes for fabrics, not for eggs, but something to start with, right? And it had the proper information about the acidity that particular dye might like or not like, about what to add, about temperatures and things like that. So you can, you know, you could buy dyes there, but also you can get that free PDF downloaded and use it as a starter, as an English resource. Um, the store, again, Herbie's Herb store in Toronto. So that's something to go to. And another thing I did at the sort of in that handout, as a sort of, I thought a little bit more about it. I actually give you examples of the dyes that either I have used from those sources or I know that somebody else has used on eggs and they worked more or less, right? Um, so these are the kinds of things that if you get it, it has worked for somebody that I know, for me or somebody I know. So uh, that is something to sort of start with, right? And then to go further, so to go into something like this book that has way more plants than I, than, than I know, and they're all local plants, right? And it has all that you can actually take a look at some point. I know, cherry, chestnut, cranberry, cucumber, daffodil, fungi, gale, whatever, right? And proper recipes, uh, proper sort of indications of how it works and things like that, and see whether it will work for eggs.